Heavyweight championship bout to defend the free world is eating up, gang, all right? I'm not talking about Mike Tyson either. I'm talking about the fight for the presidency of the United States. We've just finished in New Hampshire. If you ask me, Reverend Jesse Jackson and Reverend Pat Robertson should be healing the wounds of their flock, not asking citizens across this country to punch their ticket on Election Day. Men of God should remain in the House of God and not in the White House. Next on the Morton Guy. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to home base with me, if you will, Dr. Robert Grant, chairman of the Christian Voice. Dr. Grant, uh, Christian Voice, what is, what is that? It's a traditional value lobby, Morton, uh, dealing with family issues and so on, trying to find a way for people who, who identify with those values to have some muscle politically. All right, let me, let me ask you then, as chairman of that uh, organization, you followed Reverend Robertson's candidacy quite closely, I'm sure. Yes, I have. What are some of the basic platforms that the Reverend is stressing in his campaign? Well, basically, uh, what I would call the traditional family uh, values. Uh, uh, he's opposed to abortion on demand. Uh, he's uh, opposed to uh, pro-gay gay rights type legislation. He thinks that parents ought to have the final say on how their kids are taught in the public school, not the NEA or other liberal pressure groups. He's for strong national defense. He thinks the evil empire is an evil empire. We ought to treat it as such. Things of that nature. Well, you know, when you talk about uh, not the NEA, not uh, any other pressure groups, in reality, doesn't uh, Reverend Robertson represent a pressure group? Yeah, I, I think if you were to call parents a pressure group, then certainly he does. Does he represent all parents? No, but uh, most parents, I think, uh, would uh, agree that they should have the final say on what happens with their kids in the public school, not, uh, not some uh, pressure group. Uh, As a televangelist, uh, former televangelist, didn't he indeed... Uh, uh, have a pressure group, and I might say a very good one and an active one. Oh, he had a following, as most ministers do and most politicians do, people who identified with the particular point of view that he represented. Well, let's look at something now, because you might have some insight into this. If indeed Reverend Robertson does reasonably well in the primaries and goes to the convention with, let's say, 15% of the support of the delegates, Will his supporters turn off and not vote at all in the election if their man isn't given something at that convention? I, I think uh, Reverend Jackson's followers and uh, Pat Robertson's followers are asking similar types of questions in that regard, Morton. Uh, when their man goes to the, to the convention, uh, it, popular wisdom says neither of them are going to go all the way. That remains to be seen. But uh, how they deal with, uh, with the issues and how they play their cards, so to speak, with the party of their choice and whether that party does then uh, give the quid pro, quo, quid pro quo in return for support, that, of course, is a desirable way that it should play. Well, of course, we learned in the 1984 election that, indeed, Jesse Jackson's uh, constituency did not get anything out of the convention, and yet they still went to the polls. Yeah. We have yet to learn whether Reverend Pat Robertson's constituency will indeed go to the polls if their man gets nothing. Uh, Pat does not have all that control over those people. They're very independent. They identify with the, the issues that he articulates. But Pat is really a, a result rather than a cause. I, I identify with every issue he articulates. He's really every a Every single issue he articulates cause, I identify yeah. with, and yet I myself couldn't vote for him. Yeah. Uh, I think the point I, I was making was this, that Pat uh, came to prominence because there was a felt need in a very large community in, in, in America that certain issues were not being art articulated, 
and they, as, uh, as it were, created Pat Robertson's platform for But him. they've been articulated by lesser candidates uh, yeah. throughout the uh, 1970s and 80s. Uh, they were articulated, uh, some of them, by Phil Crane when he ran for president. Uh, some of them uh, articulated by Jack Kemp as he ran for president. So indeed, the issues have been articulated individually by candidates, but not in one package the way that Th Pat this Roberts... This is the logical evolution of that whole movement, in my judgment that uh, even back to the time of, uh, of Carter in 76, when many of these evangelical voters got in for the first time because they identified with the, the issues that Carter spoke to, and then he turned around and, of course, uh, violated those promises to, to those same people. So they turned on him in 80, and they went to, to Reagan because, again, he articulated the issues that they were concerned about. Let me go to a gentleman by the name of Tony Podesta. Tony is the founding president of People for the American Way. Tony, good evening to you. Evening. Question for you. You're the founding president of that organization. Do you think that Pat Robertson, uh, Robertson is a threat to the separation of church and state? He doesn't believe in the separation of church and state. His whole but is campaign, he a threat to that? Absolutely. If he is elected president, if he has a, a voice at the Republican convention, I think you'll see a Republican platform plank demanding that we weaken the, separ the wall of separation between church and state. How would he weaken Robertson? the wall between church and state. How he, could he weaken the wall? Well, I think if he will change the dynamic in the Republican Party. You already see Republican candidates trying to appeal for his constituency, trying to appeal in that way. But they've been he trying to appeal for his constituency since the time of Jimmy Carter. I mean, Ronald Reagan tried to appeal for that constituency, the home. He was very strong for the family, very strong for education, very anti-abortion. These are all the things that are being articulated by Pat Robertson. But it's all been lip service before. Now that he's going to have delegates at the Republican convention, unlike any other candidate from, from the Christian right before, you're going to see his influence increase over the, course of, over the course of this year and in the future. He's not just trying to run for president. He's trying to take over the Republican Party. All right, you've said that he's a dangerous fanatic who believes he is God's candidate for president. Would you elaborate on that? Well, he, he, says that he, is, he says that he is God's candidate. He, when he won the Michigan caucuses, he, caucuses, he said, what a breakthrough for the kingdom. Uh, he runs around speaking on his, on his cr Christian television program, speaking about the Bible and trying to apply it to modern problems. He says we should close the public schools. He says the answer to our problems with, with, with the debt, with the federal debt and with, and with the tr balance of trade problems, is to declare a year of the Jubilee, as, in, as they did in the Bible, and cancel all the debts. So what he, but his politics is the same thing as his religion. And what he'll try to do is to use the, use his, the office of president, use his political power as a way to, to mount his own personal evangelistic crusade across the world. Dr. Grant, do you envision uh, these uh, things that Tony Podesta talks about as ever coming about? Are we to assume that the American people are a bunch of lambs who will go to the slaughter, as uh, obviously we're being told? Well, people for the American way position themselves as the champions of the First Amendment, but they're really people for the un-American way, in my judgment. Uh, it's, a, it's a far left uh, coterie of, uh, of uh, radical groups that have their agenda funded by big money people that fund the, the whole agenda of the Democratic Party on the far left. And, you know, uh, they talk about religious freedom, but it's, it's according to their definition. And I would simply remind uh, uh, Tony and our audience that the religious uh, point of view that Pat Robertson espouses, which I don't particularly happen to be a part of myself, charismatic movement is, is uh, it, it's mainstream uh, Protestant Christianity. Some 60 to 80 million Americans believe as Pat does. He's not crazy. They are in the Episcopal Church, they're in the Catholic Church, the Methodist Church. They cut across all of the denominations, and they are part of mainstream Christianity, and they believe that God speaks to them on an individual basis, that he directs their lives, and Pat is articulating that, and that does not make him some sort of a religious fanatic. Is the press, in your opinion, <laughs> is the press, in your opinion, somewhat... Uh, jaded in its approach to a Pat Robertson, uh, for instance, uh, are, are the, is it almost atheistic in their, in their approach to Pat Robertson? Uh, I see some of the quotes that Pat made in today's newspaper coming from the Washington Bureau. Uh, he says, uh, he is a victim of religious bigotry, comparing his situation to John Kennedy back in 1960. Well, uh, that's a simplistic uh, well, response. I think there's a lot of bigotry. Yeah. Well, but, but he's comparing himself to John Kennedy. Yeah. John Kennedy was not a reverend. John no. Kennedy was not a priest. No, right? but the point he was making was that uh, Kennedy's religion was used against him prejudicially, and I think we're seeing the same thing with Robertson. People who don't understand or don't identify with his charismatic uh, religious beliefs uh, tend to use that as, as a bludgeon against him, and we see a reverse form of, uh, 
of anti-religious bigotry. The, the argument shouldn't be about his, his religion. It should be about his politics. His platform is to, is to do all sorts of crazy things. Well, what do you find uncomfortable about his platform, Tony? His platform is to close the public schools. His platform is, is to, is to uh, orient our American foreign policy based on the way he reads the Bible. He says the United States should, should support the Israeli invasion of Lebanon because it says so in the Bible. Every, everything he does, he sa it says so in the Bible, and so he takes the Bible as, as, as his political platform and uses it. Are you a religious person yourself? Uh, yes. Are you? And you he also the says there's nothing, nothing wrong with his being a religious person. There's nothing wrong with his being a minister running for office. What's wrong is when he tries to use uh, his religion as a, as a way to advance a political agenda. What it is or, is sort of the John Burke Society or, or agenda wrapped up, wrapped up in the Bible. Or, or indeed... As you might say, when he uses his position to moralize, correct? Well, he uses his position to force his morality on everyone else. Well, hasn't, hasn't morality always been forced on us? Of course. But, but why but is he so different? Because he is, he's trying to force morality. He is different. Bec he is different from other politicians in the sense that he... He's being truthful about his, himself, huh? He's not being he, is being he is not being truthful about himself anymore. He was saying a few years ago that the Constitution was only for Christians, that only Christians should hold public office. Now he's trying to, you know, temper his views and say now, that only people who some. believe in the Bible should, should hold public office. Maybe he's so he's changing some. his positions as he, tries to, as he tries to amass political I can power. remember as I was growing up hearing my grandfather say only property owners should have a vote. I'm not talking about growing yeah. up. I'm talking about 1985, 1986. Well, you grow up between 85. And 86. He, he has a little bit. I hope you have too. Next, we'll meet a priest. Next, next, we'll meet a priest who lost his seat in Congress by just one vote. That one was cast by the Pope. Stand by. Tony Podesta has joined us at home base, and we are joined at our number one loudmouth by Father Robert Drynan, a former congressman, former dean, I believe, of the law school at Boston uh, College, and now, I believe, with Georgetown University. Good evening, Father. Nice to be here. How are you, sir? After 10 years in Congress, the Pope asked you to step down. He ruled, I believe, that no priest or nun uh, could hold public office. Does your resignation indicate uh, you were in concurrence with the Pope on this issue? Uh, canon law of the Catholic Church was changed, actually, so that now the rule is that no priest or nun, nun may hold any governmental position that has civil power, whether it's executive or legislative or judicial. And the Holy Ca the Catholic Church, rightly or wrongly, thought that there's better things for priests to do than be in politics. However, simultaneous with, with that, the Holy Father and the Holy See made it very clear that church leaders and hierarchies are supposed to speak out about moral issues. And the U.S. Catholic Conference, which represents the 300 Catholic bishops, have been very, very strong and consistent in opposing the war, for example, uh, opposing age of the Contras. They are opposed to the death penalty, a long string of moral issues they speak out. And that you is the agree position. with them on those moral issues? I think I do, yes. You agree In fact, with them? I, I helped them to write some of their documents. You agree with their position against abortion, then? Oh, yes. You do. But you, when you were a congressman, how were you able to reconcile your differences uh, in, in, in uh, how you felt on an issue that the church gave you uh, as to how you felt uh, as a congressman? Well, for Martin, instance, the you the voted the, No, the only, the, issue, the only issue before the Congress was the question uh, of the uh, should Medicaid abortions be paid for. Mm -hmm. And Catholics differ on that. There's no one Catholic position. Sure, I agree with the Catholic Church that abortion is virtually the same thing as infanticide. But that does not necessarily mean that people eligible for Medicaid should, in fact, be denied uh, compensation for that uh, or funding for that abortion. So how were you able to reconcile your, your feelings? Well, there's, uh, no, there's, there's no conflict. Didn't you it? have a, dirty, a duty to serve your constituency and a duty to serve the, uh, the church? Maud, I, I think that there was no uh, conflict to resolve. I think Jack Kennedy proved forever that there's no in discrepancy, there's no contradiction between Catholicism and Americanism. All right, then how do you feel about Pat Robertson uh, having the right to run for the presidency? Oh, I think it's wonderful that Canon Article 6 in the Constitution itself said that no religious test shall ever be applied for a public office. There's been 97 Protestant ministers in Congress, and they have served very well. And I think that uh, from time to time, in various cases, I think a clergyman has a very good moral influence. There's at least three or four of them there now. Senator Danforth, for example, is an Episcopal priest. I think it should be open to everybody. And uh, would that 
qualified people would come along that would be elected. I see no conflict. Would you support Pat Robertson if he were running for Congress? Well, I think that I'd uh, so probably support somebody more liberal. Uh, <coughs> but, uh, no, uh, I have some troubles with Pat Robinson on his, on his theology. Remember now that he's not a reverend anymore. As far as I know, he has severed his connection with the ordained clergy. He is no longer under the jurisdiction of any bishop or an ecclesiastical order. Well, let me go to Dr. Grant on that. Doctor, uh, maybe you're familiar. Uh, can you just uh, discard your title of reverend? Can you just discard and go back? Uh, unlike a priest can't just discard it. I mean, he is ordained. He is ordained forever. Yeah. Is oh. a reverend only a reverend as long as he wants to be? Well, well, hopefully people who go into the priesthood or into the ministry go because they have the call of God on their life rather than just going in for some sort of a profession. And uh, I would maintain that uh, the higher calling is the ministry and the lower calling is politics. And uh, I, I think that... After looking at most of our politicians, I would agree with you. <laughs> I <suppose>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think in, uh, in good conscience, however, if a man is going to go into the political game, he ought to resign the other. I don't think they ought to wear both hats because uh, the nature of the ministry is absolutism. Uh, if you have a gospel and you believe that that gospel is true, then you do not compromise it. You do not compromise on, on the moral issues. But the nature of the political game is compromise, and you must compromise if you're going to wear that hat. Are you telling me that uh, Pat Robertson would compromise on a strong defense, would compromise on closing down the public schools, would compromise on his absolute abhorrence of abortion? No, I don't think he's after closing down the public schools. I think he's for parental choice. And I don't think that he ought to be required to, to compromise. Uh, people ought to understand... said it was the art of compromise. Yes, Morton, it, it, I think it, it the problem is. is. The problem is that no one knows where Pat Robinson is. And I followed this very closely, and I've read his books and everything about him, and he goes with the tie. And that I don't know where he where, Well, where I think he Pat Robertson today. is very consistent. He said where he stood on a number of issues all the way along. The abortion issue, parental rights, uh, strong national defense. He's never equivocated Let me on take a He wrote a book. He wrote and a I'm book, not father. defending Pat Robertson, by doctor, the way. I'm not doctor and Father, he wrote a book in 1984, all right? The answer to 200 of life's most probing questions. Among the controversial statements in his book, he expects to be alive when Jesus comes to save mankind. In the same book, uh, he says that credit and bank cards should be abolished because of the book of Revelations so that was, says that when the devil comes, no one can buy or sell without taking his mark and that the credit cards are his mark. Uh, aren't we, uh, aren't we, isn't but, this getting a little ludicrous? Was this strictly well, to sell books? No, no, not at all. Uh, there, there is a very large segment of Protestant Christianity that believes the Bible is the Word of God and that it does speak to the problems of today. Well, I, and I, Pat I is simply be. articulating that, and, uh, and uh, as he understands, he interprets it to, to draw those conclusions. That's well, his work to Grant, do Dr. Grant, you said there is a, a large segment of the Protestant Christianity. I think there's a large segment of uh, Roman Catholic Christianity that feels the same I way. I believe in the inerrancy of the Scripture. I, I believe that, that God has revealed this. However, uh, Reverend Robinson looks at Ezekiel and he says somehow from the words of Ezekiel, he knows that the Russian, the Soviet Union is going to invade Israel. Well, what are we talking about? I mean, where are these words? And likewise, he says that women should be subject to, the, to men, and that comes from the Bible somehow. Mm -hmm. And he gets all I types of... I think it does. I think it does. He, he gets all well, types of... I, I, like to, I, like I seem to, to re recall uh, there being some sort of a relationship between men and women. Uh, you know, Ezekiel 33, that Pat is... Uh, referring to him, the, the good father is referring to, uh, a, a substantial uh, body of Protestant uh, theologians do, a, do come to the conclusion that that is a predictive prophecy that does speak Magog and Gog and Magog and so on, that they have modern equivalents. And he would incorporate that into the foreign policy of the United States? Well, uh, he, he would he incorporate... Say yes or no? Well, he would incorporate that into his frame of reference, uh, just like he would uh, incorporate uh, his uh, feelings about uh, the the life of the unborn into his frame of reference. He has a right to do that. The, the problem, is not, with well, his, the problem is not with his religion, it's with his politics. What he says in, in, in looking at the Bible is I'm going to draw political conclusions out of this. For example, Russia, he, sa he reads the Bible to say that Russia is going to be destroyed by tornadoes and earthquakes. Therefore, we shouldn't, we shouldn't negotiate with the Russians. Yeah. We, should, we should throw out salt 
and, and the reason we should do that, we should throw out all these treaties, is because Russia's going to be destroyed anyway by God in, in, in the course of some sort of cataclysm. That, that's no way to have American foreign policy be dictated. Do you feel he would, uh, do you feel that's how his foreign policy would be dictated? Not at all. Not at all. I think I'm, incli I'm inclined to think that he has so many contradictions and inconsistencies that even Pat Robinson doesn't know exactly what he'd do if he were in the Oval Office. His, his, na his name is not Robinson. <laughs> I think, I think there, if, if Bob is going to attack him, he Bob, ought to at least get his name man, right. Is there any man that you can think of who is running for president today who would know what to do in the Oval Office? I, I think they're very clearly predictable. People like Senator Paul Simon and Governor <laughs> Dukakis, they have a record of service in public life. We know where they're coming from. And that I can't conceive of any of them, frankly, saying what Pat Robinson said the other day when he had some victory in Michigan. He said, this is a victory for the Christians. Well, I, I think we ought to at least get the man's name right. It's not Robinson, it's Robinson. <laughs> Next, we'll meet a man who thinks the more religious a politician, the more dangerous that he is. Stand by. Next. <laughs> Everybody, welcome back. Father Drynan, Father Drynan joins us at home base, and we're joined at another loud mouth by Dr. Edward Stevens, the Society of Separationists. And we just mentioned Paul Simons, Father Drynan did, and I thought you were trying to emulate uh, Paul Simons with the bow tie and the No, glasses. this is my own act. Remarkable. <laughs> Remarkable. I almost voted for you. You are the director of the New York Chapter of American Atheists. Is That's that correct? Right. That's right. Right. <laughs> Let's let's get right in there. <laughs> let's get right in there. You're, uh, is it your position that anyone with strong religious beliefs is unfit for public office? I've given a lot of thought to this. Uh, a lot of it has been in my uh, role as a psychiatrist, and the uh, oh, you, you got two <laughs> strikes against you. <laughs> Was this before or after you got shock treatment? Before! <laughs> okay, now, the conclusion that I've come to is that belief in a religious experience is a form of mental illness. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Let's hear this nutcake, uh, gentlemen. <laughs> A form of a mental, mental illness. illness. You got it, all right? In other words, and, and then there's something else that's very interesting about this. This form of illness only affects human beings. And as a matter of fact, in this country, by statistics that have been quoted so far, we have a pandemic. At least 70 million of them to 80 million of them was... That was the figure quoted by uh, Mr. Grant over here, Dr. Grant. So now we've got a very serious situation. 96% of the American people are mentally ill, folks. If we think that AIDS... <laughs> if we think that AIDS is a problem, let's come to the real problem. Dealing with the uncertainty of light through the creation of illusions and delusions. <laughs> What are your concerns? For instance, you now haven't let's... answered my question. Sure. Do you think that people who have a strong feeling in religion are unfit to be president? Well, you see, I pre prefer to take the position of common sense on that one. And well, you I haven't ask... taken that position well, well, thus for far. Well, for instance... <laughs> In regard to uh, common sense, uh, all uh, religionist thinking and, uh, is uh, reductionist. It starts from principles no. that are revealed and then winds up, winds up in some kind of cockamamie, torturous answer to how we're going to 
rearrange our present response to situations in regard to something that was said thousands of years ago. If you charge your clients by the hour on the couch, you must be a millionaire because... <laughs> Of the, why am I reminded of the perennial Mr. presidential Mr. candidate, Mr. Pat Paulson, when Mr. I see Mr. this Mr. man? Grant, <laughs> in regard to Mr. Grant, he talked about the higher calling and the lower calling before. Now, he referred to the politicians as having the higher calling no, and no, the no, lower calling. No, you got that backwards. Oh, you got that's that right. backwards, yeah. The politicians are the lower calling. I, well, I think God's I'll calling tell you, is I think there's only one higher calling, and that is to go to heaven. Do you believe you're going to heaven? I'm not even interested in it. I'm working for it. Ah! Man, See, I don't want to be holding your hand when the bolt hits. <laughs> do you believe, do you believe, doctor, that atheists are best qualified to serve as presidents uh, and leadership Well, you country? know, not every atheist is a clear thinker, but I tell you, I... <laughs> I take my chance with an atheist before I will with a religionist. You take your chance with an atheist I first. take my chance with an atheist. Just, so of, course, as a matter of, just fact, of course, as the like, Soviet like Union Christ, has, yes, because man. no one in the Soviet Union is a Christian who is in a position of power or leadership. So you would disqualify Washington and Lincoln and Jefferson and everyone, huh? I'm not particularly interested in what went before us, because after the world there was Moses and there was whatnot. I'm interested in what we've got now and what we're going to do Most with the next four years. Most thinking I have ever heard, doctor. <laughs> Father Drynan. In regard to Robert Drynan, in regard to Robert Drynan over here, I would like to know if Robert Drynan has re renounced his vow of personal obedience to the Pope as part of his Jesuit profession. Has he renounced that vow? Or is he always subject to recall no matter what he is doing? Well, uh, you, you, obviously, you obviously have the gentleman right here. You can, you can get the answer from Father Dryman. Well, I, I think that all clergy take some type of an oath or a vow of obedience, including Protestant clergy. No, but clergy. you've taken a special vow of allegiance to the Pope as a professed father Jesu of the Jesuit order. That's correct. He's shaking his head in affirmation right. of that. Have you renounced that vow to the Pope? No, I don't intend to either. And he doesn't intend to. That means that the Pope, at any minute, can recall you, tell you what to do. You have a vow of absolute obedience to the Pope. You're not with us. You're not with your constituency. I never thought I'd find myself defending Drynan, but here we are. <laughs> I never Thank thought, you, Doctor. I never <laughs> thought I would either, but isn't this a wonderful country yeah. that, that <laughs> this gentleman, all right, who is so up on religion, believes in none of it? <laughs> well, you see, as a physician, you have to know the disease in order to be able to treat it. So I, I, I hope... Uh, I don't, I don't I, blame I, you. I hope if I ever uh, get... I hope if I ever get sick in New York City and I need to be treated by a doctor, it's not going to be you. Well, you want to go... <laughs> if you get sick in New York City, you ought to seek out a faith healer. <laughs> now, now, are you talking... Are you, you don't believe are you in lumping, conventional scientific dear doctor, thinking? No, dear doctor, no, 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 dear doctor, are you lumping us all into who are Christians know. believing that we have to have faith healers? I mean, isn't no, that no, only sure isn't that does. only the Church of Religious don't Science so and those type don't of things? Uh, well, I mean, it has to go on a case by case basis. <laughs> have you ever worked cool. at the Improv? <laughs> <laughs> next, next, I'll tell you what we'll do. Next, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll examine whether Reverend Jesse Jackson will go from the White House to the outhouse or God's house. Stand by. All right, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. We've got joining us at home base. Joining us at home base with our other guests, Reverend Wyatt T. Walker. He is with the Jesse Jackson campaign. And I believe, Dr. Walker, you feel there is no problem with separation of church and state and uh, Reverend Jackson's campaign. Is that correct? None whatsoever. Uh, I've heard the idea bandied about here in this uh, program. And the truth is that there is no real practical separation of church and state. The people who are in the churches are also citizens of the state. 
it is a principle that the American tradition cleaves to because it is very explicit that the government shall not interpose itself in the practice and expression of religion. And likewise, sectarian religion or religion of any sort should not interpose itself on the running of the government. It is a well misunderstood phrase, isn't yes. it? In very my view, it is. Did you see Reverend Jackson's campaign as a threat to uh, that division in any way, shape, or form? Uh, not at all. Uh, you see, the peculiar sociology of black people is such that the black church has always been in politics of necessity for our survival. The black church as a phenomenon on the American scene came into being because we didn't agree with the politics of slavery, and we never have agreed with the politics of second-class <coughs> citizenship and disenfranchisement of various sorts and others. So it is that the position of the black church is that for us to be in politics is a very natural thing for us to do. And is the position of the, of the black churches that they are churches first or campaign repositories first? Well, no, we're, we're churches first. It is in this instance where I would agree and I understand the exception that some people are raising about us developing uh, financial resources for, Doc, for Mr. Jackson in our churches. But you see, we have no other places to go. It is the one institution and agency of continuity in black life. And uh, we can't go to the Kiwanis and to the Rotary and to the corporate world, so to speak. The church is not only the church. Has Jesse Jackson gone to the corporate world? Uh, I don't think so. There are, some, there, indeed, are some, there, uh, some, there are some FEC regulations which prohibit uh, uh, certain levels of donation from the corporate Well, if that is true, then those FEC uh, regulations also apply to white candidates, don't they? Oh, absolutely. So it's therefore, the board. therefore uh, white candidates should be allowed to raise their money in churches the same of as course. Jesse does. Of course. There's been no prohibition. It's just that the sociology of the white church, black church phenomenon in America is so much different. Uh, any aspirant to elective office hardly ever goes to a white church or a white pastor for endorsement. Uh, I'll let you deduce <clears throat> what the reason is. But all aspirants, white or black, who seek political office always go to the black church because it is a resource for strength, for votes, and for money in this instance. Tony, how do you with, feel about all, what he's just said? With all due respect to Reverend Walker, I think that, that Pat Robertson has been going to the white churches all over Iowa, all over South Carolina, mm -hmm. all over New Hampshire, and running a political campaign out of the out of the out of the pulpit. So he's been doing basically he's been doing the, same the same thing, thing that Jesse Jackson is. So been why doing. are we condemning Pat Robertson then if we don't condemn Jesse Jackson? Well, I thought Pat Robertson was being I thought Pat, I thought Pat Robertson was being condemned for his politics, not for his religiosity. Look, now that's what has been uh, bandied about here tonight. Well, and uh, I don't let think me ask should, a good I don't think there should be any pro prohibition are against we? a man running for public office I agree. because he happens to be a minister. All right, are we? Are we uh, on the right line here with your thinking? Is it the religiosity that gets to you about the Pat Robertsons and the Jesse Jacksons? Is it the raising money through their churches that gets to you? Uh, what gets to you about these two gentlemen? Well, I said I was going to approach this from a common sense point of view, and I think that what is it Wyatt, oh, no. Wyatt has Wyatt. said Wyatt. Ma has made an enormous amount of sense in terms of understanding the difference between a black politician like Jesse Jackson running for office and uh, Pat Robertson. Uh, Basically, I would have the same objection in regard to uh, the fitness of uh, a religionist uh, of whatever ilk or whatever the background is in terms of the reason why he came to it. But I certainly have more sympathy for Mr. Jackson than I do for uh, Mr. Robinson. Why? Because Mr. Robinson, uh, Robertson uh, is uh, probably one of the most uh, deluded human beings around. <laughs> in fact... That's what I like. Is the fact that, uh, that, I mean, he has the, uh, the ability not to see the longitudinal perspective in terms of the positions that he has taken. That he not has to, to see the longitudinal positions in terms of... <laughs> well, in other words... That's your big well, word for the night. That means where he came from in terms of his belief system and where his beliefs would take him if he were leading this people. I mean... Uh, I mean, uh, I, I said to you before... Where would Jesse Jackson's beliefs take him if he were leading his people? And when we say his people, we're all his people if he becomes the president, not just the blacks or the whites. Well, I think that that might hold true more for Jesse Jackson than it would for Pat Robertson. 
Why? Because Why? Jesse Jackson Why? has... Blacks, blacks are not Christians? A no. deeply defined social consciousness that I think uh, Wyatt has, uh, has really articulated in a very fine way. He says he's a special phenomenon. As, he As a matter of fact, over, any black Reverend, politician is going to come has up. This gentleman won you over. Uh, well, I, I, what's his first name? Ed. 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 <laughs> there's this, there's, there's, there's Dr. no way. There's no, Herm, uh, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Edward Stevens. There's no way Ed could win me over because our frame of reference is diametrically opposed. He says. <laughs> He says he's an atheist and in the same breath talks about heaven. I don't know how you can not believe in something and talk about it. As soon as a man right. tells me, as soon as a man tells me that there's no way that I could win him over, he's got a closed mind. I mean, I'm ready to be won over by anybody here tonight. I think tonight. his mind is so filled with knowledge and understanding that maybe it's closed no, just... to the tripe that you're trying no, to pass he's... on. We'll talk to the people who will make the decision in 88. Our audience right here. Stay tuned. Let's get to the folks who can really probably uh, throw some light on this. So we've heard from all the so-called experts, but Dr. Grant, you and I were talking just a minute ago, and we, we talked about uh, the IRS has some regulations, yeah. don't they, that uh, both Reverend Jackson and Reverend uh, Robertson are, are violating in, in reality. Yeah, uh, 501c3 or organizations, which is the IRS designation of churches, forbids churches uh, for, to uh, give a substantial amount of their income to political activism, and that's been variously defined as uh, the Dr. maximum Grant. of 20 percent. Let me correct Dr. The contributions are not coming from the churches. None of the money goes into the treasury of the church. None of the officers of the church count the money. The members are provided with the envelopes. They put the money in the envelope. It's their personal contribution. It's sealed. We don't count it, and we send it on to Chicago or Brentwood, Maryland, wherever the envelopes are to be sent. Hey, my, it my is position not, it is, is Je and Jesse most, be able to And do most that. black churches are not 501c3 organizations, for your information. So they are not really churches in the sense of No, they sense are though. churches, but they do not choose to be 501c3 because, again, because of the peculiar sociology of black people in America, it makes us vulnerable to the control of the federal government in order for us to change the agenda of what we've been about historically. Then indeed, uh, do the churches pay taxes on their churches themselves? No, we do not pay, we do not pay any taxes on any uh, real estate or church houses that are used solely for religious purposes. Now, Father, if we Dr Father Drynan, you're very, you're very uh, familiar with these type of laws. Why, why would they have those, those laws? Why wouldn't all churches have those laws so they could be utilized the same way? Well, it's a technical legal distinction, but I think that the main thing here is that Pat Robinson, last year, 1987, raised over $16 million from using the mailing list owned by his own Christian Broadcasting Network. So it's, in a sense, it's a bad rap to say Jesse Jackson is going to black churches when this man has gone to this mailing list that he built up over 20 or 30 years as a television event. Is there evangelist. anything wrong with that? Uh, really? I, yeah, I think that it's least against the spirit that they came to him because he was a clergyman, and he turns around and asks them for a political objection. But when they donate to him, when they contribute to him as a clergyman, uh, they know what they're contributing for. When they contribute to him as a candidate for the presidency, they again know what they're contributing well, for. As long, as long as they clearly understand what the contribution is for, there's no difference yeah. between the Jackson campaign and the Robertson campaign. Yeah. People should be able to contribute to either candidate uh, it doesn't matter whether you I think the 501c3 regs are, are bad anyways. I think churches ought to be able to do whatever they want because when you go through the door of that church, you don't suddenly take off your civic uh, uh, freedom to, to function. You ought to be able to do inside the church just exactly what you do outside. Well, then again, I understand in some cases that the churches that uh, Jesse Jackson speaks in, I don't know about Reverend Jackson, but in some of the churches Jesse, uh, Reverend Robertson, I know that uh, the churches Jesse speaks in, in some cases are not being used at that moment for any religious function whatsoever. They are there strictly as a meeting hall for Jesse yes, to meet that, some of his... Of black light, primarily the 
center of black life in black communities. Black that's, society. that's our As public it used form. to be when, when uh, my, my father was a kid. Yes. When my father was yes. a kid. I, I'd like to go to ask the uh, studio audience uh, the question, should religious officials run for public office? But first, I'll speak to these folks who are up at the Loudmouths now. Ma'am. Yes, Could you identify I'd like yourself? To, yes, I'm Janine Alton House, and I'm a member of the Society of Separation of State and Church. And I believe very much in separation of state and church because that's why America became so great for 200 years, because there was a wall between religion and politics. Now, if that wall is going you to be read, broken have you read down, the history books then we history might, now? yes, you have to know history because if you don't know history, then history will repeat itself. It if you look at all the anyhow, other countries, just as you were repeating the, the, him. the wall between church and state is a myth. It no, never it was is and not. never is. No, it is not. Do you realize sir. that until no, 1891, we took federal because tax dollars, America, we gave no, them to Christian America denominations for missionary well activity? For so why don't you learn your history? Why don't you learn your history? I mean, you talk, atheism is a form of religion. No, it is of not. Of course it is. No, it is not, of sir. You are not is. aware of what the atheism is. Well, madam, atheism obviously you are not mind. aware of American history. Yes, so dip it, yes. sit down. Yes, yes, yes. Good night. Good night. Yes, sir. Would you identify yourself, please? Yes, sir, Moore. My name's Henry Schaffler. I'm with the American Constitution Committee. And uh, I'd like to go back to Plato's Republic, where he outlines in there the idea of a philosopher king. We didn't have Christianity back then, but the idea was that the person who rules should be an enlightened person. And uh, when we came to the founding of this country, uh, as Dr. Grant mentioned, most of, the, most of the men who framed the founding documents were religious in one way or another. Now, they weren't all Christian. Some were deists, some were Unitarians, and some were Christian. But uh, the Declaration of Independence, for instance, outlines that our rights are endowed by our Creator. That's right there in the founding documents. And that it's not a government, it's not even the Constitution, which would come later, uh, it's not any leaders, but it's God who endows Americans with their rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yes, but these folks over here, you know, they haven't had a chance to read that document. It's only been around for 200 years. So the point I want to make, if, if there's enough American people out there that believe that Reverend Jesse Jackson or uh, Pat Robertson are those enlightened individuals that they would like to represent them, I think that's their right. Absolutely. I happen to believe that... Uh, you're probably correct, they won't be elected. Uh, but I think they have every right to run. I don't, it doesn't matter with some, somebody comes from the cloth, from being a doctor. Uh, if you wanted to run someday more to be controversial, but you have the right. God help, God help us all. God, for, God, God forbid. God, God help us all if I ran. God, God help Those us guys all. be in real trouble. We'll be right back. Tired of sitting home and watching the same old boring television shows? Television is alive and well at Channel 9. So be part of our studio audience, if you dare. For tickets right to tickets for Morton Downey Jr. Show, 9 Broadcast Plaza, Secaucus, New Jersey, 07094. Please include your area code and phone numbers, and we'll send you tickets for the next available show. Sorry, only six tickets per request.